you have your Bible, turn to the book of Jeremiah with me tonight, please. Chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter number 1. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, the priest that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. And it came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, said I Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. Father, I pray that you'd anoint your word as it goes out. A sower went forth to sow. That's what I'm doing tonight, Father sending it forth. Bless it now, in Jesus' name, amen. The book of Jeremiah is a powerful book, folks. Very powerful. Uh, if you read anything, any commentaries in the Bible, you'll find out that every one of them, practically to a man, will tell you that he's so unique, there's nobody else like him. His name means Jehovah is high or exalted of God. Jeremiah is a priest Notice what it says in verse number one. The son of Hilkiah, the priest that were in Anathoth. You cannot choose to be a priest. You're either born into it or you're not. So there's no choice here. He is a priest, but he's also a prophet. What's the difference? Is there a difference between a priest and a prophet? There's a huge difference. A priest ministers what has been set forth as a sacrifice, for the most part, what has been done. A priest, therefore, ministers for the people to God. That's what a priest does. A prophet is one who receives a message from God. A prophet is one who may be raised up under varying circumstances at different times from different places. The fact of the matter is there are no two prophets in the Bible that are identical. They had a school of the prophets in the Old Testament. You remember back in the time of Samuel, they had a school of the prophets but if you do study on that and try to run it down, you'll find out that uh, they never did really produce any prophets. It might have simply been a school of instruction for teaching. I don't know, but I do know this. I do know that if you're going to be a prophet, God's got to call you. And if you're going to be a prophet, God's going to use you. And if you're going to be a prophet, God's going to make you part of what you preach. And this is what we have unique about the prophets of God. Jeremiah was a prophet from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. He was first a priest because he was born into a priestly family. But God set the priesthood behind him and called him in the prophet, in the prophecy. So this made him different. Jeremiah prophesied right before Israel was taken into Babylonian captivity. When I say Israel, it's the southern two tribes, 586 B.C. He's unique in the sense that he is what's called the weeping prophet. In the book of Lamentations, Jeremiah walks through the streets of Jerusalem and he weeps and he cries over his people. I don't know of anybody in the Bible who loved his people more than Jeremiah. He loved them. He loved them dearly. But he knew exactly where they were headed. He had opposition, as always. If you're serving the Lord, you're going to have opposition. He had people who professed to speak for God, who came against him, yet they did not speak for God. Jeremiah was the only one speaking for God. Jeremiah's mentors were Zephaniah and Isaiah. So you couldn't have any better teachers than that. Amen. So this young man came up well, and he was prepared for the ministry, yet he was reluctant to go into it. If you'll remember all those through the Bible, for the most part, that God calls and raises up and makes something out of them, they're usually reluctant. Look at Moses. He says, I can't speak. He said, look at me. He said, I'm, I'm slow of speech. And God said, who made your tongue? <laughs> and he, of course, he gave him his brother Aaron to speak for him. Did, was Aaron really a help to Moses? No. No. For the most part, Aaron was a hindrance to Moses. Because Aaron sure didn't do anything for him when he was at the top of the mountain. No. It's, 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 it's uh, you know, when God calls you and raises you up, 
Uh, you, you have to do what God called you to do. You remember Jonah, don't you? He called him to go to Nineveh and preach to them. He went the opposite direction. <laughs> uh, he's not the only one who's ever done that. People are still doing that. Running from God. Let me give you a little advice tonight. You can't run from him. There's nowhere to hide. You can't get away from him. There's nowhere to go. The best thing to do right now is just yield to the hand of God on your soul. If the Lord's speaking to you and he's called you into something, don't, you don't have to run to some man to get it settled. Just get with God and get alone somewhere and crawl in a hole somewhere, shut the door, go out in the woods, go out in the boat, go somewhere and get alone with God and find out and make sure calling and election sure. So Jeremiah was unique. In chapter number one and verse number five, it says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Now, is Jeremiah the only one that God formed in the belly? No, he formed them all. This is why I'm so adamantly opposed to baby killers. Whether Democrat or Republican, it makes no difference. And they're on both sides, folks. You've got, they call themselves, uh, what, uh, right to life. No, not right to life. What is it? Woman's right to the body. What is it? Pro-choice. That's it. Thank you. They call themselves pro-choice. Well, I believe in pro-choice. Give the babies a choice. If they choose to die, okay. But they don't give the babies a choice, right? No, they don't. They're killers. They're killers. They kill the, 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 the vulnerable. And let me tell you something about this, folks. That's an indication of your character and the character of the nation. Is how you treat the most vulnerable in your midst. That is the truest mark of your character. And there is nothing any more vulnerable than a baby in its mother's womb. But he said, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Boy, born into the priesthood, yet God called him as a prophet while he was in his mother's womb. You're not an accident. You're here for a reason. God's got a reason for you to be alive. Yes, he does. And I hope that you found that. I hope you know why you're here. I hope you know. I really do. You say, well, I'm here to make a living. No, that's, a, that's an incidental thing. Eating, sleeping, making a living, driving cars, that, that's incidental. That's a peripheral. What is your real purpose in your life? What are you here for? What are you living for? You're not living just to live. You're living for a reason. And if you're not living for a reason, you're just existing. And that's the problem with America. So many people, they just exist. They don't live. In chapter number 1, verses 7 and 9, The Lord said unto me, Say not, I'm a child, for thou shalt go to all that I send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Look at verse 8. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. He's warning Jeremiah right off the bat that he's going to be preaching to people who are going to look at him and stick their tongue out at him. They're going to wag their face at him. They're going to throw fingers and everything else at him. They're going to mock him. And he's telling them, it doesn't make any difference what they say. You do what I tell you to do. One place in the Old Testament, he told him this. He said, whether they forbear or whether they receive the word of God makes no difference. They'll know that a prophet hath been in their midst. And you have to have that attitude. You really do. If you're going to minister for God, if you're going to preach his word, teach his word, if you're going to minister, you can't be affected by the way people react to it. Amen. If you, if you think the ministry's lovey dovey, <laughs> you, I warn you now, pick something else. <laughs> it's a whole lot easier to jerk a wheel off of a car and do a brake job, or do a valve job, or to plow a field, or paint a house, or build a house, or, or plumb a house, or wire it, or, or sit on a judge's bench. It's a lot easier to do that than it is to get in the ministry. You better know that God's got you where He wants you. Jeremiah suffered. He suffered greatly. But one of the strange things about Jeremiah is chapter 16, verse number 2. God said, do not marry. He was not permitted to marry. Jeremiah 16, 2. Why not, preacher? Because Jeremiah is an object lesson to what God's going to do to the children of Israel. You see, the reason that Israel was going into Babylonian captivity, Judah, the reason they were headed to captivity is because they had committed adultery on their husband. Amen. Who's their husband, preacher? Jehovah. Amen. In the Old Testament, Israel was the wife of Jehovah. This is why God said to uh, Hosea, go 
buy a woman, a prostitute. Go buy her. And when you buy her, there's going to be children. And I want you to name them uh, uh, Jezreel, Lo-Ami. I want you to name these children because they represent what's going on in spiritual relationship between Israel and Jehovah. You see, in the Old Testament, Israel is the wife of Jehovah. In the New Testament, the church of God is the bride of Christ. There's a difference. In the Old Testament, he gave Israel a writ of divorcement. Did you know that? He divorced her. He sure did. But then he tore it up. Because his heart would not allow him to continue with it. This is, this is the kind of relationship God wants with you. He does not want this he doesn't want this business type relationship. He doesn't want this, uh, this, this, you know, this standoffish type relationship. He wants the most intimate relationship he can have with you. When he walked with Adam in the cool of the day, it was because he loved Adam. And he wanted fellowship with him. Remember, folks, there's not a word from Genesis to Revelation, not one single time where an angel is even capable of fellowship with God. But you are. I'm not saying they can't, but I'm saying it's not in the scripture. But you are. Because he made you in his image. He put in you the capacity to respond to him in a way that nothing else can. Do you do that? Amen. Is your life about him? It's not about stuff. It's about Christ. Amen. Oh, Christ. Oh, Jesus Christ. Bless his righteous name. Amen. There's no other name given among men. He hath given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Your church is nothing but an organization of a bunch of people coming together if Jesus Christ, our Lord, is not in the middle of it. Amen. It's just a bunch of people. Really not a whole lot of difference between it and a bingo parlor. If the Lord Jesus Christ is not the heart and soul and the heart beat, of this church, then we're just a bunch of people come together and we have our meals and we shake hands and we play music and smile at each other and, you know, and go about our formalities. But what have you got if you don't have the Son of God? So he said to them, don't marry. He said, I want you to know how it feels not to have a wife. And that's something too because the Bible says in the book of Genesis, God made Adam and then he made Eve as a helpmeet. So he needed a helpmeet. He gave the woman as a helpmeet to the man. The woman complimented the man. The woman was made for the man. And it, and it, and it completed Adam. Amen. So he, uh, he, uh, he's called. And he's called before he's even born. He suffers. The prophets are used as object lessons. Isaiah chapter number 20, verse number uh, 2. Isaiah was told to walk naked and barefoot. For three years as a sign and wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia. Three years naked and barefoot. Now I don't know how far that, I don't know if that's stark raven naked. But according to the scripture it says naked and barefoot. You consider the time, the culture of that day. I'm sure that there was a lesson to be learned in that. What was that? Well I'm going to tell you what it was. Israel would constantly go out and trust the countries around them, make alliances and allegiances with them, covenants with them, you know. Uh, they would do this as a kind of a support against the enemy. And God said, don't do that. These people are not your, that, that, this is not who's going to defend you. I will fight for you. So what did the Lord do? He said, I want you to go naked because I'm going to strip the Egyptians naked. I'm going to take all of their pride away from them and I'm going to cause them to walk naked. And he did. The Egyptians paid a, paid a supreme price. And Israel had to learn another lesson. In Ezekiel chapter number 4, the, uh, Ezekiel the prophet is told to lay on his right side for 390 days. And then flipped over to the other side and laid on it. To lay on his side all that time. Why? Because he was bearing the iniquity of the people. Israel may have been able to build the biggest buildings. They might have had the finest walls. They may have had the finest agriculture for their day. They may have been an expert at everything they did. But none of that meant a thing to God. God put those people there to be a witness to the world. That's what Israel was in the world for. 
He said, you're a kingdom, a nation of priests. Did you know that? He called the whole nation of Israel a nation of priests. You're the, you're the go-between. They come to you to come to me. And uh, the prophet had to learn the lesson because the prophet had to be part of what he was preaching. You know, when a man preaches from the pulpit, if he's preaching intellectually, you can be stimulated intellectually. There's nothing wrong with intellectual stimulation. We all need to think, right? But it won't move your soul. That preacher, if his soul is not in what he's saying, you'll know it. And if it's not, then what you have is a professional or, uh, orator. And there's plenty of professional orators out there. Every time you turn your television set on, you're being entertained by a professional actor. They're not real people. That's not, a, that's not the person. They're acting. From what I've seen from most of the actors and actresses from Hollywood, I like the character they play much better than the one doing the play. <laughs> because when you see the real person, you don't care much for them, do you? They're arrogant, snobbish, stuck up. They, th they think because that they can act and not be themselves for somehow or another that qualifies them to speak about heavy duty issues. And they're completely uninformed, don't have a clue. Ezekiel chapter number 24, God told him, he said, Ezekiel, I'm going to take your wife away from you. In verse number 16, son of man, I will take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with a stroke. Boy. And then he says, don't weep for her. Man. And that's something. Boy, God requires a lot of his prophets. I'm going to take your heart's desire, your sweetheart. I'm going to take her away from you in a stroke. In other words, she's going to die just like that. And you can't weep. Boy, that's tough stuff. That's tough. That's tough. And uh, that's what, uh, that's what uh, walking with God <clears throat> sometimes will. It'll produce a hardness in your heart. It could produce a hardness in your heart. <clears throat> let me uh, let's see if I can find this. I had it written down. I'll just have to give it to you for memory. I will. I heard this on the radio yesterday, the day before. This man was in the ministry. He'd been to Bible college. He'd, uh, he'd gone to a church, and he was serving in that church, and he was continuing his education. He had a beautiful little boy born, beautiful little son. That little boy lived a few years, very few, three, four, five years, and drowned in a pool. It devastated him. He said he went off, got in his car, and he drove off, and he drove away. He went out as far as he could get, and he began to scream at God. He got mad at God. He got mad. He began to vent his rage, screaming at him. Here I am studying your word, trying to minister, and you take my son. What kind of God am I serving? What is this all about? Is there any, is there any reality to any of this? He let loose. He emptied his soul. He poured it all out to God. When it was over with, he felt a little better because he got it off of his chest. Then it started bothering him because he had talked to God in such a fashion. Talked to him pretty rough. He talked to God pretty rough. He went home and he got in his closet and shut the door and got on his knees. As believers always do, they'll eventually find their way back. God said something to him when he was down on his knees. He said, son, he said, you can say whatever you want to. I can handle it. <laughs> Are you listening to me? Don't say what you think you, God wants to hear. Don't concoct some nice, sweet, religious little prayer that you got out of some prayer book somewhere. That's why your prayers are dead. That's why you won't pray. Talk from your heart. Tell him what's really going on inside you. He already knows. You see, the only way he's going to deal with you is on the basis of truth. God knows the truth and he knows what's going on in your heart. He knows what's in your life. 
But He wants you to come face to face with that so that there's nothing between. No put on, no show, no sham, no facade. It's just you and God. And He did. He said, God spoke as clearly to me as I'm talking to you right now. He said, I can handle it. So you vented yourself. So you told me how you felt. You got it all out. I can handle it. Some of you say, well, that's sacrilege. and That's blasphemy. Now, let me tell you something. To put on a show where you live this superficial, make-believe Christian life, that's the sham. Try to get you out of it. Try to get you out of East Tennessee cultural religion. Everybody's saved around here. Nobody's lost in East Tennessee. <laughs> but just as many dope people addicted to drugs, just as many babies being born out of wedlock, just as many homes busted up with divorce, just as, just as much sorrow, pain, and heartache, and hurt, and woe, yet everybody's born again here in East Tennessee. See what I mean? That's cultural Christianity. And it stinks. Shoo! <laughs> <laughs> Stinks. <laughs> My grandmother and grandfather used to say, Pew, corn. <laughs> Pew. Stinks like corn. <laughs> you know the difference between corn and dirt, don't you? Boys like to play in the dirt. Carns. Dirt doesn't stink. Corn stinks. <laughs> don't look it up in the dictionary. It's not in there. But if you're from around here, <laughs> you know what that word means. <laughs> and getting to corn, look what it says in Jeremiah chapter number 2 and verse number 13. My people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold a water. All right. Now, he's talking about the difference between a fountain and a cistern. What's a fountain? A fountain can come in a lot of different ways. It can come as a waterfall, it can come as a river, it can come as the rain, it can come as the dew, it can come as a flood. All the water in the Bible many times comes in many different ways. But it's coming and it's life-giving and it's fresh. And you can live by it. You can go out here and dig into the ground. You can dig down like the Jacob's well. They say it's deep. And they say that they had to dig through solid rock to get down to the water. Underneath you, there's water flowing everywhere. All you have to do is be able to dig down. Tap into it. That water is alive. What's a cistern? A cistern is any kind of a container. You can dig it into the ground, put a, put a liner around it, or you can have a bucket or something that catches the runoff from the earth or from a roof or from something like that. It catches that water and it catches it into a container. But think about what you've got in there. Think about where that water has come. Think about what all goes on on the surface of the earth and this water is washing it down into that cistern and you're going to go drink that stuff. That can be very filthy compared to well, that you dig a well, that you go deep into the ground and get the fresh water and pull it up out of the ground. Compare that to the filthy runoff from the earth. And the Lord said through Jeremiah, he said, you got cisterns out here. You've forsaken the fountain of living water and you've dug yourself cisterns. And you're not even good at that because it's cracked and it won't even hold water. That's pretty bad, right? Sure. To try to substitute the living water with something that you've made. <laughs> Isn't that something? Do you realize that anything on this earth, if it's not from the Lord Jesus Christ, is tainted? And you realize that there is nothing that you can get from the Lord Jesus Christ that is tainted. He's pure. He's pure. <laughs> Amen. He's pure. His word's pure. His spirit's pure. His fellowship is pure. His love for you is pure. What he wants for you, what he gives you, it's all pure. But instead, we'll turn away and we'll turn to a cistern. And we're going to collect water that, uh, you know, where the dogs and the animals and the rest of them have been. And it's going to wash right through that and wash down in there. And you're going to reach down there and get you a big handful of that. And that's going to be what you drink. I went down to Turtletown. My uncle lived down there, Turtletown. And I used to go down there and 
pushed the water away from the creek and the crawdads would be crawling around in there. And he had a pump and that pumped the water up to his house, up the hill. And I'd take my hands like this. I was about six, seven years old and take my hands like this. And I'd drink that cold water out of that uh, spring. Water was just bubbling up out of the ground. Spring. Anybody know what a spring is? You've seen, it's, you know, a lot of city folk, they, don't, they think the only place of water is from a spigot, you know, and you have no idea. But that, that was the coldest freshest coming up out of that spring and the crawdads were everywhere crawdads all over the place something else is beautiful wonderful that's what god says i'm giving you that's a type of the holy ghost when you try to make a substitute for it it won't work will it no it won't first corinthians chapter number 10 and verse number four the bible said and they did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was christ now, I don't know what the Apostle Paul, a lot of folks say, well, now, what's he saying here? I mean, what does he mean that the rock followed them? That's quite a thought. Did you know that the Jews, a lot of the old Jewish sages teach that the rock that's mentioned back in the book of Numbers, turn to the Numbers chapter number 21, verse 16. Numbers 21, 16. And from thence they went to Beer, that is the well whereof the Lord spake to Moses, Gather the people together, and I will give them water. Then Israel sang this song, Spring up, O well, sing ye unto it. Numbers 21, verses 16 through 18. The princes digged the well, the nobles of the people digged it, by the direction of the lawgiver with their staves. Now how deep a well are you going to dig with a stave? That's not a shovel or a pick. That's a stave. You're not going to get very deep into the ground with it and have to. You see, that rock that followed them was Christ. Now, some of the old Jewish sages said that there was a rock literally rolling on the surface of the ground that followed Israel wherever they went. You know the rock of Horeb? You remember the rock? Ron Wyatt. You remember Ron Wyatt? He's called the amateur archaeologist. You know, Ron Wyatt, he did a lot, of, a lot of stuff over there. Whether this is true or not, I don't know, but there's a photograph on the Internet of a huge rock at Horeb, and that rock is split right down the middle. Like you, <laughs> you've been reading about it too, huh? Like you'd take, a, uh, take an, a, 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 what do you call it, an awl? It's been a while since I busted wood. It's not an axe. What's it? A maul. Is that it, maul? Yeah, take a maul. <laughs> and you bust that log in two with that. It looks like somebody took a big maul and just busted that rock right in two. Just like that. And, of course, they say that that's the rock that uh, was split asunder. Well, now, who's to say it isn't? You know, I don't know. But the bottom line is there was a rock, and that rock was busted, busted asunder, and the water did come forth from the rock. And the rock is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the water is a picture of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost brings life to us, right? Yes, he does. But here's the thing about this. What we're reading over here in Numbers chapter 21 and 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 is the idea that regardless of where Israel went, and you know they were out in the desert, folks. I came up through the Sinai. I don't know if I ever told you. I have years ago I told you this. It's been a while. I've never seen anything like the Sinai Peninsula. We came up out of Egypt. We were on a bus, and we were going into Israel. I was with Brother Bevington. That's when we were in Egypt, that's quite a place. We came up out of Egypt, came through the Sinai Peninsula, and went into Israel. As we rode up through that Sinai Peninsula, it started getting bad. The, 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 the sand was blowing everywhere. And the women, you could see women walking on the side of the road, and they were carrying stuff on their heads and on their shoulders. And they're everywhere. They're all, and they live in that stuff. They live in an environment that is so foreign to what we're used to here. You can't imagine. You have to see it to know what I'm talking about. Now imagine, if this is anything like that, when Israel went through here, they're going through a place where water is very important. If you don't have it, you're going you're gonna to thirst to death. You can go a lot longer without food than you can water. So all they had to do was to stop somewhere and say, Lord, we're thirsty and begin to sing and take the stave and stick it down into the ground, and up from the ground would come the water. That's what it says in Numbers chapter 21. The water would just come up out of the ground. 
which would make you think it could be possible that wherever they went, wherever they walked, and of course, remember this, they were led by God. The Lord was leading them, and so the, the water was following them underneath the surface of the ground. So you can't prove that, preacher, and you can't prove it's not. Amen. <laughs> you can't prove a negative. You know how that goes. <laughs> I don't know, but I do know this. It made no difference where they were. The water was there. God took care of them. Amen? Aren't you glad that makes no difference where you are now? When He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you until He said, I'll never leave you, sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. That's our heritage, folks. That's our identity. That's our mark. We have the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't belong to the Lord. But if you, if you do belong to the Lord, you have the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit is the, is, the, is the earnest of our inheritance. So the water was there, and the water came out from the rock. Psalm chapter 114, verses 7 through 8 says this, Tremble thou earth at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, which turned the rock into a standing water, the flint into a fountain of waters, water for a thirsty people. Jeremiah went down into Egypt against his will. He warned the people when they began to turn to Egypt for trust. He said, listen, he said, it's the will of God for you to submit to the Babylonians. That's the will of God. Now, that's not the kind of message you want, but that's the message God gave them. The reason it was the will of God is because the judgment was set and they were going to go for 70 years into Babylonian captivity. That's the way it was going to be. Nothing's going to change that. And the land would enjoy its Sabbaths and Israel would learn some lessons while they were off in Babylon. Right. Jeremiah was carried into Egypt. What happened to Jeremiah? Nobody knows. Nowhere in the Bible does it record Jeremiah's death. There's some traditions out there, quite a few just like there is with anything. One big tradition is that Jeremiah took a young Hebrew maiden girl with him into Britain. And she was of the royal line of David. And she went into Britain, and from her, uh, generation after generation, uh, the British throne was established by a Hebrew girl who came from the Hebrew monarchy. All right, what's that mean? That Jeremiah carried a stone with him into Great Britain, and that was called the coronation stone or the stone of destiny. That stone, and this is a fact about the stone, that stone was underneath the, thr the, crown, the throne of the British monarchs for hundreds of years, and when they would, uh, when they were, when they when they would sit uh, as as the monarch of England, the stone would be underneath them. But it's my understanding that just recently, the stone was taken back to Scotland. <coughs> Seems to be such a a big argument over that. Now, what is that preacher? That's called British Israelism. I have never subscribed to British Israelism. Never have. One of the reasons is because. The, there is no, there's no supporting documents. There's nothing that can prove this. This is, this is something that a lot of people believe, and I think they have a reason for wanting to believe it. And let me tell you what that reason is. Before America, 1776, declared its independence from King George, the greatest army on the face of this earth was Great Britain. Great Britain. They had the largest navy, and they had, a, they had, they had the most... I guess most disciplined, well-disciplined army was Great Britain. It was an absolute miracle that these little fledgling 13 colonies were able to throw off the yoke of the British crown. You need to think about that. That was a miracle. That was as big a miracle as Israel on May the 14th, 1948, when David Ben-Gurion declared the sovereignty and independence and the rebirth, once again, of the nation of Israel, because I think it was the very next day that all of these Arab countries attacked them, and for eight years they fought a war of independence, and they came out victorious. It was a miracle 
that the nation of Israel, the state of Israel, was born and able to survive. No doubt in my mind about it whatsoever. So America was a, was a miracle, and so was, and so was uh, Israel. Great Britain, to this very day, is still a monarchy. Great Britain, to this day, has still got an enormous influence over this earth. There are, right now, major powers in the world, major powers in this world, that control what's going on. Okay? Now look what's happening right now. You've got all these people coming up from Honduras and Guatemala and, and El Salvador and San Salvador, and, you know, and, and, and the Latin American countries. You've got all these people coming up from the south. Okay. When you go south of the border of the United States of America, you've got a bunch of countries down there, but they don't control the world. They can't even control their own country. Venezuela right now is on bankruptcy. They're, they're fighting in the streets. Okay. Somebody said the other day that China may come into, was it China? Somebody told me the other day, I forget who it was, well, I think it's China. China is thinking about coming into South America and, and establishing some kind of a something in there. And I told them right then, I said, the Monroe Doctrine, yeah, yeah. President Monroe said no European or foreign power will be allowed to establish authority in these Latin states. Okay, so they're dismissed. So where does the power lie? China can field 200 million horsemen. Yes, they can. Yeah. Russia, a bear up there in the north, according to the book of Ezekiel. Israel and, 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 and England, England, a nation that's such a small island, and yet it has an enormous power over the earth. You wouldn't believe what kind of power England has, both monetarily and a lot of other ways. Then the United States of America. Look at this country. We're coming together, folks, right now. Things are coming together, I firmly believe, that are going to fulfill Bible prophecy. This country is on the verge, and I hope it never happens, but it looks like it's on the verge of another civil war. If that happens, what happens to the power of the United States? This country is divided, folks. It is divided. There's no longer any dialogue going on in America. No longer. That side and this side. So what's going to change that? Well, I know one thing. I know the Lord Jesus is coming back. And I'm looking for his appearing. I'm looking for his appearing. I want him to come. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Folks, if certain people gain power in this country and it, conti and it continues with the progressives, these people that are absolutely 100% di diametrically opposed to who you are and what you believe, America won't be fit to live in. And you will see persecution like you've never seen it before. It'll happen if the Lord doesn't call us out of here. That's why it's so important for you to go to the polls and vote. If God doesn't change my mind this coming Sunday night, Lord willing, I'll give you the reasons I'm going to vote. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. You have that freedom. You've got that freedom. You've got that right. But I'll tell you what I vote for. And I think that's important. I'm going to go to early voting. It started today, but I saw on TV a few minutes ago where they were wrapped around a building. The lines are mile long. That's unusual for early voting, but this is the first day. But I always try to go to early voting. The Bible's alive. This stuff's happening. You're watching, you're watching, you're watching the, dis the disintegration of your culture. Right? It's falling down around your feet. And you can't, you can't hide from that. It's happening. And, I, and, and I'm going to tell you something else, too. Please understand me tonight. Don't put your hope in a political party. Don't put your hope in the Republicans or the Democrats. You need discernment. You need to know when you go into that poll and you vote what you're voting about, what it's for, what does this person stand for, what do they believe, and go do it. And I believe God will bless us. I believe he'll bless us. If the church can't stand for the truth, the church won't stand for anything. 
And thank God He's given us the truth. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah. Father, in Jesus' name, bless your word tonight. The folk who've gathered together in the house, I pray, Lord, you'd bless them. I pray, Father, you'd open our hearts and we'd see, we'd understand. You'd give us the discernment that we need. In thy holy name we pray. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen.